G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to Mags TV. So today we're going to be taking a look at a still very in development title. You saw the trailer before the intro. This is Task Force Admiral. So, first things first, the footage you'll be watching during this video was provided by the developers themselves. I've actually been in contact with Dry Dock Dreams Games for quite some time, so this footage dates back to very late 2019, and some of it is as current as just a few weeks ago. Some of it you may have seen before in other videos if you've been uh, following this game at all, some of it will be completely new, and all of it is very, very pre-alpha, to the point that basic sounds haven't even been hooked into some of the animations at this point, and as always with any kind of look at a game that's at this point in development, everything you see is subject to change. But it should also give you a pretty good idea what TFA will look like in its final form. But first, what is Task Force Admiral? Well, at its core, TFA is a strategy game, a carrier task force command simulation based in the Pacific in World War II post Pearl Harbor. Basically, if you've ever wanted to play the Enterprise versus the Imperial Japanese Navy, this is the game for you. So, let's start with the simulation, and I need to stress here, all of this comes from the developers and their plans for the game. These are the intended mechanics as described to me. So, in most games I've played that feature carriers, aircraft are nothing more than an animation used to show an attack. They always have the fuel to get to the target if it's in range, they always make a recovery on the carrier unless they're shot down, the damage model is nothing more than a health bar, and they have no flight model, they fly in rails. This is the first major difference in TFA. Not only do the aircraft have both flight and damage models, but they also have fuel amounts and weights modelled along with ordnance in much the same way as a simulation like IL-2 would have them modelled. Fuel does not define just the range, but also the flight time of the aircraft. Aircraft performance will change between being fully fuelled and loaded up with bombs and being on vapours and clear of stores. Damage to the aircraft is not just a health bar. The damage that is applied will affect performance, and aircraft can suffer mechanical failures, both due to combat damage, and sometimes just due to failures on the deck. As you can see from the takeoff videos, aircraft have to be pulled up from below deck and set into position for launch. Once a squadron is in position, which is arranged much like a real life squadron would have been arranged on a carrier deck, the aircraft must take off in a manner just like they would in real life. If an aircraft suffers a failure, it delays the whole deployment of the flight, while the aircraft already flying burn fuel, shortening the time they can operate for. In this situation, you as an admiral would have to make the choice on if to wait for the aircraft to get going, or to maybe pull that aircraft back down below deck and allow the rest of the flight to depart one aircraft short. Speaking of taking off, you will have to turn into the wind if you want your aircraft to do that. Problem is, the wind doesn't always blow in the direction you want it to, and in the time it takes to deploy or recover a squadron, a carrier can cross as much as 30 to 40 nautical miles. This is less of a problem if the wind happens to be blowing towards the target, but if it happens to be blowing away from the target, you'll need to keep that distance travelled in mind as it will affect how far your aircraft have to travel to both get to the target and to return and recover. So, we've just launched aircraft, now what? Well, on lower difficulty levels as I understand it, you'll be able to watch the attack happen. However, in higher difficulty levels, you won't be able to do that. When you deploy an aircraft, you'll need to give it a flight route, a target to either attack or recon, and a return rendezvous point to recover on the carrier. On top of this, you'll be able to set a few options, such as how aggressive the aircraft will be, how they'll react to targets, and how they'll react to it being attacked, and also how they will handle their radios. Now, assuming your pilots are maintaining radio silence, you won't actually know how well the attack went until they make the rendezvous and report. If you choose to have them broadcast constantly, that broadcast between your task force and the aircraft may be triangulated and could lead to attacks on your task force by the Japanese as they locate and begin to hunt you. So, you'll need to make some careful choices in regards to how your pilots operate in combat and how much information you really need versus the risk of your task force being located and put under threat. Now, I mentioned recovery. This is also interesting. Once again, you'll need to turn your carrier into the wind to recover planes, but first, they have to find you. When you deploy an aircraft, you will set a flight route, as I mentioned before, including a rendezvous for recovery. However, once launched, those planes will not get any updates on where you are. That would require the radio, so you need to make sure you are exactly where you told those aircraft you would be at the time you said you would be there. 
if you were not, if you get driven off course or you just ran too fast or too slow and failed to arrive on time, you'll have a bunch of thirsty birds just circling over a vast blue sea with nowhere to put down, and lost aircraft don't respawn. You only have a restricted number of planes, and when they are all gone, you're no longer combat effective. So you can already see how in-depth the developers are looking to go with this, and this is only the start. I mean, before you can send in the dive bombers, first you need to find the ships to bomb. Recon aircraft are used for this, and they have mechanics all of their own. First thing is the gathering of reliable information. So when you send out a recon aircraft, it may find nothing, or it may spot something. What happens then depends on the settings and instructions you gave to the plane before you deployed it. Firstly, you may have set it to go directly home when seeing something. So the recon aircraft will work out roughly where the something it has spotted is, and then it will return reporting that it has seen something upon getting back to the carrier. But then you only know that there is maybe something at the detected location, not what it is or if it's a threat. The example given to me was a scout flying out and seeing something in the distance. Now, the something is a reef, but the aircraft does not know that at longer ranges. It could also be a small Japanese patrol group. To find out what that something is, the scout would have to investigate, which you would instruct it to do before launching, in which case it would realise that it's a reef and will report that it's a reef in that location once it's back. However, let's say it's not a reef. The scout may get in, ID it as a hostile fleet, and then return, and you now have a target. Or it could get intercepted by Japanese aircraft as it approaches attempting to identify the ships, and get shot down, or if it is set to get really close, potentially get shot down by flak, and never return at all in these cases, in which case all you will actually know as commander is that you sent out a scout on patrol, and it never came back. This mechanic was described to me as a system intended to recreate the uncertainty of information and the risks of gathering better intel. Drydock wants you to be forced to make choices that are not always based on perfect information, just like the real naval commanders did in World War II, while also creating a system where there is a risk of getting better information. And don't forget that as I said before, mechanical failures are a thing, so aircraft being lost doesn't necessarily mean it encountered an enemy. It could have just suffered a failure and been lost. Now, while you're doing all this, the Japanese Navy is doing it to you as well. The same tools and the same restrictions. Now, this is only a small part of the mechanics behind carrier operations and aircraft, and we've not even mentioned other surface ships, which will be in-game. All surface ships will also have complex damage models based on the internal structures of the real ships. The ship models themselves are looking to be incredibly detailed. If you've been following the devs for this on social media, you would have already seen this, but down to having the correct murals on the walls of the carriers next to the deck elevators. There are, however, a couple of restrictions. First one, and I'm sure it's already in the comment section, no, the Japanese fleet will not be playable in Volume 1. The development team here is very small, and they are very aware of how large the scope for TFA could get, so the plan is to focus Volume 1 on just the US fleet. Once it's complete and finished, Volume 2 will be developed, and it will include the Japanese fleet, and at least part of the British fleet from the Pacific, and so on. It's also not planned for release this year. As for when, I'm not going to venture into that. That's all on the devs to talk about. And speaking of that, there's still quite a lot to cover, but I want to do that with an interview with the developers here. I really like this team, and I really like what I'm seeing of this game. So I want you to have the opportunity to ask a few questions yourself. So if you'll leave a comment down below with anything you want to ask, I'll do my best to cover it in a live interview on the channel very, very soon with the developers for Task Force Admiral. Now, TFA is also one of the upcoming titles that will be published by the newly resurgent Micropose, as you saw at the start of the introduction. There's a couple more here, and I actually want to follow them too. These look like fantastic titles, and, you know, worthy of having the Micropose brand put on them. Um, I'm also really interested in seeing what Micropose themselves is developing. At this point, I am pretty sure that B-17 Flying Fortress remake is on the cards, but we're still waiting for an announcement on that one. But anyways, guys, I'm going to call this one here. As I said, I am really looking forward to this. I'm also going to leave a link in the video description down below for the Steam page for Task Force Admiral. So if you want, you can jump over and add it to your wish list and start tracking it and keeping an eye on it yourself. 
it's silly to have to mention, but no, this is not a sponsored video in any way, shape, or form. I just really liked the look of this game when I first saw the first clips and snippets of it uh, in late, uh, late last year. And I've, having spoken to the dev team, I really like the ideas that they have here. I really like where they're going with this, and I want to help promote this game. So this is all just because I like this, so it's my goddamn channel. I'm going to uh, toss in with this one, because this just looks great. Anyways, guys, let me know in the comment section down below what you think. Let me know your questions if you have any. And until next time, remember to click that like button if you did. Share and subscribe if you want to see more. And as always, take care.